A few things to keep in mind when applying Bernoulli's equation. One is, figure out where the stagnation points are going to be. This location here at 2 will be a stagnation point. The flow is coming towards this surface and it has to divide and go either direction. Most of the streamlines will go off in one direction or another. The one right in the middle will go straight in and make contact with the block. So any particles coming along just beside this streamline come in here and come almost to a stop and then go out along the block like that. So the velocity here is zero. That's what makes it a stagnation point. Now we can apply Bernoulli along a streamline between any two points. And in this case we pick one and two, the two points on that stagnation point streamline. h1 plus p1 over rho g plus v1 squared over 2g equal to the same for location number 2. And the heights are the same. The velocity at location 2 is equal to 0. So that tells us that the pressure at 2 will be higher than the pressure at 1 by rho times v1 squared divided by 2. That's the stagnation pressure and it's higher than ambient pressure. It's made up of two components. The static pressure, or static head, that's this P1, the pressure in the, in the flow throughout, and the dynamic head, or dynamic pressure, the rho v squared over 2. We can take advantage of this effect to make measurements of flow velocity. If we know what the pressure is at location 1, we can measure the pressure at location 2, and the difference in those pressures, typically measured on a manometer or some other differential pressure device, will tell us how fast the fluid was going here, simply by applying Bernoulli's equation. And if we rearrange to get the pressure relationship, and then reverse it to find out the velocity in terms of the increase in pressure, we get this square root relationship here. So we can, knowing the pressure, figure out what the velocity must have been at location 1. Problems with using a pitot tube, it has to be lined up with the flow. The flow has to be coming straight on to it. And you must be sure that P4, <coughs> that is whatever you're applying at the manometer here, is the same as P1. You can work that out on an airplane by being fairly confident that the direction the plane is traveling is the direction that the flow is hitting the pitot tube in, and by having the port that you use to measure the pressure at location 4 located on a straight flat wall of the plane somewhere where the external pressure will just be atmospheric pressure. So when you see on an aircraft this tube sticking out just down below the nose of the aircraft, that is a pitot tube and it's measuring the velocity, the airspeed of the aircraft using exactly this approach. A refinement on this idea is the pitot-static tube, and the idea is a pitot tube, so location 1, location 2, we can measure the pressure in this central part of the tube, which has got a hole open here at the front. Likewise, if we put a concentric tube around it, then we can put holes in the side of the tube here at location 3, so that the pressure in this outer uh, sec concentric section of the tube will be ambient pressure or at least the pressure right outside these ports at 3. Now because these streamlines are going in a straight line the pressure at 3 will be the same as the pressure at 5. Because the velocity is the same at 5 as it was at 4 and the elevation difference is negligible then the pressure at 5 will be the same as the pressure at 4 and because these streamlines are all parallel, the velocity the same, and uh, no significant elevation difference between 4 and 1, then we'll have the pressure at 4 being the same as 1. So thus the pressure at 3 is the same as the pressure at location 1, and we get away from the, uh, the problem we were talking about in the previous slide. This has the advantage that when we go to make the measurement, we just need to measure the difference between P2 and P3. So if we connect each of these tubes to opposite sides of a manometer, that differential pressure measurement gives us a direct indication of the velocity.
And finally, we can extend this idea with the uh, Bernoulli equation to any bluff bodies we're dealing with. Streamline going from 1 on the center line, hitting a stagnation point at 2. The pressure at 2 will be much higher. The fluid accelerates around the bluff body, the thing that's in the way. And here the streamlines are closer together and it's going much faster. And the pressure here is actually lower than nominal atmospheric pressure. Likewise, the pressure up here is lower, and if the body is symmetric, it's lower in exactly the same way, so there's no net lift force. Now, if this body was curved like a wing, then there might be a lower pressure on top than on the bottom, and the result would be uh, an offset lift force. Location 4 ideally is a stagnation point if we have no separation in behind this bluff body and then on to location 5 which will be at the same pressure as location 1. <clears throat> More realistically what we see is location 1 stagnation point at location 2 the flow accelerates over the front half of the body and then there's some kind of separation swirl and a wake that happens in behind the body. So typically P2 is considerably greater than P4 and thus there's a pressure drag on the body. This pressure here is lower than that pressure there and as a result there's a net drag force due to that pressure difference even if there is no friction or insignificant friction. And once we get to 5 we're again back to having the same pressure as we had at 1, roughly atmospheric pressure. So this is called bluff body drag or form drag and it's due to the pressure difference. We've got stagnation pressure on the front and a pressure not too different from atmospheric pressure on the back.